Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends. My name is Sarah Gerner, and I'm the cultural program coordinator here at Deutsches Haus. And it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to tonight's closing reception of our current exhibition and the panel discussion entitled At the Grassroots, Urban Gardening as Politics, which we are happy to present with the support of the Urban Democracy Lab. Our panelists tonight are Sophie Hochhäusel, Andrew Newman, William Losasso, and um, our moderator, Hilary Angelo. First, please let me express my gratitude to the people and organizations that have made this lecture possible. First and foremost, I would like to thank the DAAD, the German Academic Exchange Service, for their continued support of the academic programming at Deutsches Haus. The PhD candidate, Sophie Hochhäusel, who is sitting right at my left, um, is one of our panelists today, and she is the one that brought both the idea for the exhibition and um, the accompanying panel discussion to our attention on the recommendation of um, her PhD advisor, Elise George, who is also in our audience today. And we wanted to say your heartfelt thank you to Sophie and to Elise for, for making this event happen and bringing it to Deutsches Haus. I would also like to extend my thanks to Becky Amato and the Urban Democracy Lab for their crucial help in putting this event and the panel of distinguished guests together. So thank you, Becky. Our events would not be possible without our tireless student workers and interns. And last but not least, we would like to thank our audience members for your interest in all of our programming and for you know this amazing showing for tonight's panel. So I am one of the many New Yorkers who can't live without a garden or the semblance of a garden. I have a terrace and some flower pots, and so we grow um, tomatoes, and we have like a lilac tree and all these little things, like all these crazy things that New Yorkers somehow make do with. Um, and without um, spending at least a few hours each week with my hands in the soil, I'm personally really, really excited for this panel and to hear what all of you have to say about the politics of the urban garden in the past as well as the present and in an American, German, and Austrian context. This panel discussion, as many of you who came a little bit earlier know, is um, also accompanied by the closing of our exhibition, Urban Agriculture and Modern Housing in Austria, Health, Food, and Labor in the Cooperative Settlements from 1903 through 1933, which was curated by Sophie. And this exhibition documents the redefining and repurposing of urban spaces in and around Vienna in the early 20th century, and the transition from what started out as a play and exercise garden, where people were encouraged to take light and air baths, which I also encourage, by the way, I think it's a good idea, to a more permanent and politicized spaces of urban food production and modern housing. So working with soil and with plants isn't necessarily seen as an overtly political act, but feeling this connection with the land, particularly in an urban environment like New York City, where earth is sometimes hard to come by, ingrains an understanding of the world around us. And as the announcement for this panel discussion declares, gardens are not neutral territories, but can advance political agendas, form sites of resistance, and tools of social control. And we will examine some of these um, examples in today's discussion. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists and um, who will elaborate in much more detail on the subject matter of urban gardening as politics. So I will start with Sophie. Sophie Hochhäusel is a PhD candidate in Cornell's University's History of Architecture and Urbanism program, College of Architecture, Art and Planning, and a visiting scholar at Columbia University. She holds an MA degree from Cornell University and a Master of Architecture from the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna. Her scholarly work centers on the history of modern architecture and urban culture with an emphasis on science and technology as well as garden studies. Among other texts, Hochhäusl has published a book on the socio-political mapping efforts of philosopher and economist Otto Neurath, an article on the production of Greta Lihotsky's Kitchens for the Austrian Settlement Movement, and a book chapter for Reading the Architecture of the Underprivileged Classes, edited by Namdi L.A., which is forthcoming. Hochhäusl has also written a children's book on Viennese architecture and is the recipient of the Graham Foundation's 2013 Carter Manny Award. Andrew Newman, who is uh, seated uh, second from your right, is a sociocultural anthropologist whose research combines urban ethnography with anthropological approaches to environmentalism. His interests include urban political ecology, 
land use issues, reclaimed urban spaces, social movements, and the relationship between globalization and the city. In his field work, he focuses on environmental and urban politics in multi-ethnic district of Paris that is primarily populated by residents of Maghrebi and West African origin. Currently, he is working on two Detroit-focused projects, a community-led People's Atlas of Detroit, being done in conjunction with Building Movement of Detroit, and a collaborative project with Dr. Ju Son Jung on ethical and sustainable food in the city. Bill Lo Sasso, who's seated right there, is the executive director of La Plaza Cultural de Armando Perez, and that's butchered. I'm sure you'll be able to say it much better. <laughs> a community garden at the southeast corner of Avenue C and 9th Street, founded in 1976 as the result of a partnership between community groups Charas and Green Gorillas. La Plaza grows edible and non-edible plants and flowers and sponsors community events through much of the year. In, to, in addition to his role at La Plaza, Los Sasso is also chair of the Economic Development Committee of Community Board 3 on Manhattan's Lower East Side. Last but not least, Hilary Angelo, our moderator tonight, is completing her PhD in sociology at NYU in a couple of weeks and will be assistant professor of sociology at UC Santa Cruz in the fall. She studies the relationship between social understandings of the environment and urbanization from micro-interactional to macro-historical perspectives. Her interests include urban and environmental sociology, geography, infrastructure as a mediator of social relationships, social theory, and visual and historical methods. Her dissertation traces a century of urban greening in Germany's Ruhr region, region focusing on the different understandings of nature in diverse urban environments. Before pursuing her PhD, Angela worked for five years with the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, primarily on issues of participatory design and immigration and public space use. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to hand things over to our panelists, and please join me in giving them a warm welcome. Good evening. I would also like to thank uh, the German House and the Urban Democracy Lab at the Galton School of Individualized Study for inviting me here tonight, and especially Sarah Girner and Becky Amato, who have um, put together uh, the panel tonight, as well as the exhibition. We've been back and forth about all of it. Um, uh, I would also like to say that um, we've been privileged to actually start this discussion via email um, before we all gathered here tonight, and in uh, so uh, the four of us. And uh, in this discussion, we found out that we really have a lot of overlapping interests, and uh, the one with which I would like to begin today, and that is also the topic of discussion, of course, is um, the political aspects of urban gardening um, as it pertains to uh, the history historical work I'm doing. In my work, and, and you see some of it uh, in the exhibition, I follow the growth of one single allotment garden cooperative in Vienna, um, a very small cooperative of really seven people in the beginning, to the growth of an organization that encompasses more than 200,000 Viennese. Um, this uh, growth happens over the course of 30 years, so I followed them over three decades between 1903 and 1933. So I think it is important to point out that this um, organization and the formation of such an association in itself is a political act and that these people, these Viennese citizens, championed and spearheaded a debate on different urban issues that they thought should be a common good. But these uh, issues were diverse over the course of the period of three decades, um, obviously, and very quickly I will show some of these aspects and the four different phases that are also represented in the exhibition. What you see here um, is the beginning of the allotment garden cooperative, as Sarah mentioned, in the play and exercise garden. The play and exercise garden was really a space to facilitate the discussion of health in the industrializing metropolis. This in itself would not have been maybe a political act, but 
this cooperative, and it was a naturopathic cooperative, did this in defiance of academic medicine. So if we see these children, and this was actually a cooperative promotion of the newly launched children's program in the play and exercise garden, in front of the seminal uh, church at Steinhof, that was uh, the epitome of Otto Wagner's mental hospital, um, this really meant that these people thought that they had championed health differently than academic medicine had. With the beginning of World War I in 1914, we see the transformation and the moving away of issues of, of health and uh, uh, healthy dieting um, to questions of food provisioning and what we call urban agriculture. This is also the moment where the cooperative vastly transforms from 3,000 to 170,000 by the end of the war. And this is a particularly well-kept allotment garden plot, but the density is fairly um, uh, responsive to and cor corresponding to other uh, garden settlements. Um, and also you get a sense of the landscape that this um, prompted. Um, finally, after World War I um, and in the progressive area of Red Vienna, I trace how these allotment garden cooperatives were transformed into settlements. Together with food provisioning, also the question of labor became really important. And you see here the construction, the manual construction of settlement houses. They were consciously not standardized and the bricks were burned on site. You also see this chain here, the allotment garden plots in the back and the rise of this new typology of garden settlements in the back. Uh, finally, and this is the concluding phase, um, I show the transformation of the progressive phase of Red Vienna into um, Austro-Fascism uh, beginning in 1932-3, so to say, um, and the co-option of the cooperative structures that were built. Um, organized in military fashion under the so-called voluntary labor service. Um, the cooperative structures eroded. Uh, everybody who was part of um, the former cooperatives had to s sign up for the voluntary labor service. And what uh, seems to be um, a picture of family life here was really, um, it really shows also in the back, if you look at the structures more carefully, um, the, the hardship. So, yeah, gardens um, are not neutral. Um, I hope that with these documents, um, maybe I could also begin a discussion of the documents that help us uh, excavate these spaces and help us understand these spaces, which are, of course, always um, in transformation and always in flux. Um, yeah, first I want to... Just again, thanks the Deutsche House and also um, the Urban Democracy Lab um, so much for putting together this event, which I've already learned a huge amount from, and I hope the short presentation I can give is a bit of repayment of what I've already picked up just being here. It's been really great. Um, and I hope this is the start of a longer conversation. Um, but so Detroit is often cited as an example of a city that's an urban agricultural mecca. Um, and this is primarily because what distinguishes Detroit from many other cities, as many of you probably already know, is the immense quantity of open land that's available for cultivation in the city. Although I'm avoiding the word vacant for reasons that I'll shortly explain. Um, in fact, there are so many unused parcels in Detroit that you can literally create the footprint of the other city where I do field work um, out of all the unused parcels, which is Paris, France. Um, at least this is all the open space that's not being officially utilized in Detroit. Um, this landscape has sometimes been described as part of a new urban ecosystem, uh, the so-called urban prairie, that has been produced by a combination of factors. Um, on one hand, there are brown fields that have been left after factory closures, an immense amount of space in Detroit is from auto factories that are now closed. But Perhaps more jarring are the open spaces where, um, where residential areas lay, lay empty. And um, this is a result of several ways of devastating out-migration to the suburbs. And unfortunately, through this history, um, out-migration to the suburbs is not always a story of upwards mobility. Um, particularly in the last 10 years, um, a huge amount of out-migration has been kind of people pushed out by foreclosures. 
So um, the, the, the larger political economy of movement out of Detroit is something I'm happy to talk more about in a second, but that, that which is an important part of the story, which is how this stage gets set for urban ag in Detroit. Um, but there is one big problem with the narrative that I'm relating to. Um, it lends itself to a very powerful, appealing kind of mythology about Detroit as the ultimate urban blank slate. Um, urban agriculture often plays a problematic and central role in this dominant narrative. And by that, what I'm really talking about here are representations of urban agriculture more than the practices themselves. I should say that right up front. But in this kind of, in media coverage and documentaries, urban farmers essentially appear as kind of heroic characters who sweep into the city, purchasing their own little house in the prairie for you know, $8,000 or whatever the story is. And, um, and it's only we're right in the middle of you know, Detroit's east side, for example. And um, this is sort of the new urban frontier in a way more literal than Neil Smith ever imagined it when he wrote the book of the same title about the East Village. Um, and what these pioneers are often cultivating, we're told, is a kind of new utopian image of the city um, that in some cases curiously divorced from the history of the places itself and the people in it. Um, and in some ways, often, it, there's a fascinating symbolism in a lot of these representations where urban agriculture is almost this kind of Eden-like nature that's come to cleanse the sort of post-industrial city of the sins that were there before in a lot of these stories. Um, but in these narratives, it's easy to forget that Detroit is still home to 700,000 people, um, which actually makes it larger than Boston, Seattle, or Atlanta proper. Um, and my point in relaying this isn't just to be kind of a grumpy crank. Um, there is indeed something special about people very special about people creatively reappropriating land and reimagining what the city is and what it can be. I mean, that's very much what Henri Lefebvre talked about as the right to the city, um, just these kinds of things. But the point, however, that I want to make today is that this actually has a long history in Detroit, and it's very much intertwined with other histories that are core to, the, to Detroit, particularly with regards to the history of, um, it, there's a kind of intertwining, if you actually look at the history of Detroit, between the history of social movements in the city and the history of agriculture. And a lot of that gets erased in this kind of blank slate narrative. Um, and in fact, the bankruptcy of recent years, in many ways, sort of fits into that quite nicely. So, um, so it's, it's really, if you're talking about the politics of urban agriculture and the politics of how cities are represented, it's important to look closely at urban ag in Detroit with regards to these recent events. And when one looks closely at Detroit in the past and present, um, urban agriculture really starts to look like an umbrella term for a wide variety of activities take, undertaken by people with very different types of means and very different types of ends in mind. Um, it's really hard to even when you say, well, what is urban agriculture? I mean, there's a whole range of different people farming for different reasons. Um, you can go back to the late 19th century. Um, there was a progressive era, era in Detroit named Hazen Pingree, who this is, the, I think, during the Depression of 1893 who instituted a program called Hazen, Pingree's Potato Patches, which gave sort of, which basically transformed unused land in the city, even at this point, into a kind of commons where people were allowed to grow potatoes for subsistence. So, and in fact, interestingly enough, um, mayoral administrations play a really important role in urban ag, um, the state does. Um, you had a very similar program in the Great Depression, which is Frank Murphy's vacant lot gardening program in the 1930s. Um, these are auto factories, which in the middle of the 30s might have been slowed down a little bit at that time, but this is very much during a period of Detroit's industrial, you know, the 30s is a slowdown in the industrial heyday of Detroit. It's kind of between two big booms, one of the 20s and one of the 40s, but it's not necessarily, you know, you have vast tracts of open land in the city even at this time. And the reason there was so much open land in the city in Detroit, even this early, it's fascinating. Um, <coughs> You're used to pictures of Detroit in the present like this, but in the past, the city was always expanding and annexing territory at a rate that kind of reflected the optimism, the eternal optimism of its um, leaders. And so there was always a huge amount of space in the city. And many of the people who came to Detroit were rural to urban migrants, and it made sense to make use of this land in these ways. Um, actually, in my field work, one urban one municipal-led urban ag initiative that was very important was in the 70s under Coleman Young, known as the Farm A Lot program. And this latter program merits mention for really important reasons, primarily because in the 1970s, um, Coleman Young w is the first mayor, to, well, he's an African-American mayor who came into power in a very contested election in Detroit, right at the period that Detroit becomes a predominantly African-American city. And um, 
I interviewed um, one prominent food policy advocate who actually helped co-author Detroit's urban farming ordinance who described farm a lot as kind of cultivating a generation of activists as well as actual gardens themselves. So in fact, you get this idea of urban ag in different decades is actually producing a whole series of activists along with that. And in Detroit, there's a racial politics to that because this is at precisely the moment that middle class African Americans place in the city is being, um, is under attack, that you have people laying down roots. And for him, farming was a way of reconnecting with the agricultural past of his grandparents and parents. Um, so urban ag has that very important local meaning. Um, the political nature of that experience with the person I'll call William um, with farm a lot was often implicit. You know, people thought of themselves, people, when you talk to them, they're just growing vegetables. There wasn't an explicit politics to it. But that wasn't always the case, and urban ag in Detroit can be very, very much political at the forefront. Um, in the 1990s, an African-centered school called Nasaroma focused on the spirit of what one activist and farmer described to me as revolutionary black cultural nationalism or a revolutionary intercommunalism. And so this idea of communalism is really interesting to think about what it can mean in different contexts, um, which made agricultural core aspect of its curriculum. Um, the farms at Nursaroma were again more than a place of growing food. This was yet again another kind of, there was a kind of political cultural ferment that took place in the 90s in, in these spaces in Detroit, which led to two of the most kind of well-known urban farms in Detroit right now, which kind of had a trickle across effect, if that makes sense, in the city, particularly from a publicity point of view. Um, one of them is called Feedem Freedom, um, which has, whose founders kind of, what they essentially did is, I mean, their experience was very much rooted in the civil rights movement in the North and later on in their involvement in the Black Panther Party, actually, where they sought to kind of update the food distribution programs of the Black Panther Party in the 60s and think about what urban ag meant in that context. So it was a really interesting connection between urban ag and that past. Um, the other, which is D-Town Farms, it's fascinating. It's, it's become such a magnet for researchers and documentarians around the world that the, the urban ag organization has actually had to create its own internal IRB or internal research board to deal with all the requests for interviews and so on. Um, but like Nasromo before, the main operation they do here, there is much about education and um, almost producing engaged citizens as they are, I mean, urban democracy, basically, as they are about actually growing food. This is a kids' event. Um, and frequently, organizations like this have kind of reached the point of being foundation-driven. And, and they're actually taking the role of you know, the old public health infrastructure of the city and the education infrastructure of the city increasingly playing that role. And it's actually becoming almost, what's happening is almost you're seeing urban ag and urban farms as a new type of governance in some ways, or it's becoming part of that in the city right now, this kind of new form of governance that's emerging in Detroit. And so with all of this creative energy spinning around urban ag in Detroit, there's a kind of diffusion that's happening, um, particularly starting in the 2000s, it seems like every institution suddenly had their farm or garden as well. Uh, most famously, I don't know if anyone's seen the documentary Grown in Detroit about the Catherine Ferguson Academy. It's an all-girls um, high school for pregnant high school students um, who instituted a farm. They have, there's a fascinating documentary about them. It's somewhat problematic, I think, in its terms it represents the city in some levels, but it's also a really good introduction to sort of the questions in Detroit. And, um, but they kind of, them, that documentary and a number of others have sort of brought this to, to light. Um, and then um, in the late 2000s, a local banker named John Hance amassed over 1,900 parcels on the city's east side with a plan to create an industrial scale farm called Hance Farms um, with Wall Street investors behind them. The idea was to say, okay, let's see if we can make urban ag a, like something like big ag in the city. And it generated a huge amount of publicity that the actual farm idea was shut down pretty fast um, by opposition on a number of grounds. A lot of people actually lived, you know, they bought something like 60 or 70 acres, which, I mean, to think of urban land and acres is kind of mind-blowing, especially in New York City, you know, when you think of square inches. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there were people who had, like, isolated houses amidst the plots that kind of pushed back against it. and. Um, this farm is still going to happen, although it's shifted from being food to trees. And now it's going to, I think it's, um, I have a quote where it's going to grow picture oaks, maples, and high value trees. So it's this idea for a tree farm in the city, which is interesting. Um, then um, urban ag has also kind of had this other 
kind of percolated up, so to speak, into policy in another way where um, in 2013 a new, very comprehensive, kind of radical plan for Detroit's future was released called Detroit Future City. Um, it's probably amongst American cities one of the most radical plans insofar as it, you, when you think about urban greening and so on. I mean, a lot of the ideas about urban sustainability that have been currency in Europe for some time um, appear really big in this plan in a ways that they don't usually in US plans. Um, one of the more, con well, there's several controversial aspects. I won't go, I can go into it later. Um, but one of them is to use urban ag as sort of fill for a lot of spaces, depopulated spaces in the city. And certainly when you look at renderings of the city and how the city's represented, um, you see urban farms as just kind of fill. And there's no questions about you know, who's gonna farm this and for what, or what's gonna be grown or how it's gonna be grown, all the really key aspects of it. But I think this is a classic example of what I mean by the, pol what, and sometimes we have to be careful about the nebulous politics of urban agriculture when it becomes kind of greenwash, so to speak. And, um, and it gets divorced from the practice, the lived experience of it. Um, so in some ways what I'm saying today, a lot is kind of a warning from Detroit. Um, however, I would say that some of the groups I've held up that are kind of connected to social movements of the past that really think about politics in a perhaps more insurgent way is like the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, who I mentioned before, like D-Town Farms, or Feed and Freedom. I wouldn't, I don't necessarily mean to kind of set up a dichotomy and look at these groups as, oh, this is the way to go or something like that, because I think there's some serious questions that urban ag needs to deal with, um, particularly if it's on a certain scale, justice questions that come up. Um, for example, with questions like in an industrial city like Detroit, you have lead contamination issues. Well, who has access to knowledge, know-how, and so on, resources to remediate the soil? You know, who has access to the research? In theory, you can actually get <coughs> soil tested really easily, but access to that knowledge is not evenly distributed. Um, a similar issue is from a more political ecology standpoint, the inputs and outputs for urban agriculture in terms of things like water can, are important to think about, particularly in Detroit, with right now the water shutoffs that happened in the context of the bankruptcy in Detroit this past year were so immense that the United Nations came out and called it an affront to human rights. Um, so if you're growing and you're using city water, like what does that mean? You know, what are the questions around that? So um, these are, I think, important questions to think about. And um, I don't have an answer for them right now, but I think what's sure is that Detroit, I think, is one of the best places where we can and we are kind of working through these connections between urban ag and social justice in cities. So thanks. First of all, thank you so much to our sponsors for putting this on today. I'm really fortunate to get to share the table with such esteemed colleagues. Um, my goal really was to just kind of provide an overview of what um, a functioning community garden in Lower Manhattan looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I guess my, my fancy title is Executive Director of the Garden, but I refer to myself as the Chief Complaint Taker, um, <laughs> which I say half in jest and half in truth. Um, so the, this is just an overview from a friend's balcony of what the space is that we um, spend most of our weekends at getting sunburned. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's really a, a very diverse space. We have um, 45 or 50 plots on the right, a performance venue on the left, and a planted lawn and green space on, um, on the far left. And th the title of this topic was Urban Gardening is Politics, and I don't know if I've heard a more true statement recently. Um, and I think that that's a good thing. I think that there's, it's good that there's competing interests and competing views for what these spaces should be. New York tends to be a very anonymous city, and this forces to my mind at least, some conversations and some discussions that might not otherwise occur. Um, we have so much stimulus and so much concrete in New York and so many people and this just brings people to a sacred space, an open space which is in such short supply that I think there's something to be gleaned from that that is, that is very positive. Um, I'll try to give some background on La Plaza Cultural. So it's on East 9th Street and Avenue C in the East Village. Um, and this space really has been through an evolution ever since it was started. It was started in the disinvested East Village of the 1970s when this neighborhood looked very much like some parts of Detroit look today. Um, and some local artists and a Latino-run community group got together and decided they were going to take back their neighborhood. And they cleared out some vacant lots. Um, and it was less about gardening and really about community empowerment. And they started community and social services, um, some arts and culture, and trying to fight the crime and the drugs that were going on in the neighborhood. And I think this is really one of the first examples of using this space, which is now a garden, to advance the social agenda. Theirs wasn't about producing food or producing 
flowers or an aesthetic, it was about taking back a neighborhood and creating a place that was livable. Um, so this community group, uh, Charis, um, eventually got a lease to the site and then got a lease to another site and moved on. And another group of people, as the neighborhood was gentrifying, seemed to come in behind them and see this open space and this very dense urban jungle that we all live in and kind of had their own vision of what it could be. Maybe it could be a park for kids. Maybe it could be a soup kitchen to serve the people who needed to eat in this neighborhood. Perhaps it could serve uh, as a place for the homeless to, to, to live. And there was ultimately, they were run out and there was some drug dealing that go on. And you see that you have these open spaces in New York City that are just put to use by whoever can get their hands on it. Um, so the neighbors finally took this space back, and this is as East Village is starting to gentrify and the demographics are starting to change in New York City, and the East Village particularly is coming back, and they took it back. Now the city has an eye on these spaces, and they know that they're worth something. Let's put them on the rent rolls, and let's get rid of these open spaces and put them to productive economic use. And I won't get into the history of it, which is documented well, but the neighbors fought and fought and fought and fought off some development, and some gardens were lost, and ultimately many gardens were saved through an agreement with the Bloomberg administration and then Attorney General Elliot Spitzer. So today, La Plaza is one of the gardens that was saved. We have a renewable lease with the Parks Department, which was just renewed last year for another four years. Um, today, we're about a little over half an acre. We are member managed entirely, meaning that if you need dirt to grow plants in, we bring the dirt in and we buy it with our membership dues or we write grant applications. Um, we do a ton of community programming, which is a large part of the internal politics of the garden, is deciding what are we going to do. Do we want to have food workshops? Do we want to have flower medicinal workshops? Or do we want to have theater and, and plays? Um, and to me, that's the politics on a day-to-day -day basis that I see. There's, there's larger external issues that my colleagues have spoken to. But to me, it's how do the people who actually use the space agree to use the space or argue about the use of the space, really, in practice? Um, and it ranges from gardening to growing flowers to growing tomatoes to bringing your kids there after school. We've got some school groups that come in and use it for educational purposes. Um, we try to treat it as a wildlife area. In lower Manhattan, there's not a whole lot of chickens or fish or turtles, but if you come to our garden, you're going to see it. And kids that may not otherwise see wildlife get to see it in our, in our little corner of the world. There's some people who tend to use it for neighborhood organizing. They see an open space that doesn't cost money to rent. They see people who are active in their community, and they come in, and whatever the cause of the day is, they want to bring them into the fold, and they hand out their pamphlets, and they ask them to use the space. Um, so in practice, our community garden is really more than a garden. It's a, it's a garden community is the way I describe it. it. It's a collection of people from very different backgrounds with very different interests with certainly different purposes for the space. Um, and really the trick, the, the politics of it, is to make it all work um, on a day in and day out basis. It usually gets accomplished. There are plenty of arguments, for sure. But I, I think one of the larger external political questions is the existence of community gardens in the first place. Anyone who knows this part of Manhattan knows it is incredibly expensive to live here, and affordable housing is in incredibly short supply. Um, and this seems to be the pervasive argument. Long before I came to this neighborhood, people had their eyes on these spaces, these gardens, for housing, whether it be market rate or affordable housing. And the refrain that I still hear is, if you want to grow tomatoes, move to the, move to the country, move to the suburbs. This is a city. This is um, an urban area. Come on, the people need to live. People need to live affordably. And this seems to be the biggest argument that I experience on a day-in and day-on basis. But I, I tend to, to fan the flames a little bit. Even though I'm an advocate for community gardens, I think that it's an important conversation to have. So I really enjoy that political discussion whenever it comes up. There's some obvious uses for the garden. I think um, they come to mind. People come and try to go flowers in a city of concrete. Increasingly, people are growing food not just as a hobby, but to feed themselves. Um, as you know, it's incredibly expensive to live in New York. The cost of living is, is really no joke. And we're starting to see families that are coming in and harvesting in June, July, August, and taking that home and eating that. And this is part of the way they get through the day. Many people, myself included, use it to escape the city. New York is a wonderful place, and, and I choose to live here. But you need a respite sometimes. And I think the community gardens, as much as they're functioning agricultural sites, are, um, they're a part of quality of life that's kind of intangible and hard to put your fingers on, but they're very necessary. They allow you to connect with nature. Um, a little less obvious things are sometimes you just need to get to work outside. And I, I really do think that getting to go dig in the dirt um, 
and, and, and plant a plant whether or not you eat it or you come by and never look at it again is therapeutic. Um, and you may be growing something to be eaten or somebody else may eat it, but it, it really, um, it, I think it helps you out as well. We're, we're started originally as an arts and cultural institution, as I mentioned, um, in a social service uh, space. So we do tons of community programming. We have a built amphitheater that is actually built from the ruins of the buildings that once sat on that site. Um, and this is one of the larger parts of internal politics of the garden and frictions is people tend to wander from the middle of a play and say, here's a tomato, I'll just pick that and eat it. And I see you have a pear tree, and these peaches look particularly good. Um, and I say this to be funny, but it's true. These are the internal politics of how do you, how do you resolve these things for the people who actually use this day in and day out. You know, people spend a lot of time growing peppers and jalapenos, and they're proud of their grandfather's onions and garlic that they've been growing forever. Um, and they want to use it, but uh, there's this friction between it being a communal extension of the city um, and also wanting to have your individual plot and your individual use of this uh, own slice of your own backyard, if you will. Um, and then there's obvious uses, less obvious uses, and there's strategic uses. There are people who come here to organize, as I mentioned. There are people who come here to um, make sure that they can get a foot in the door and then use it for art installations for their own theater and programming needs. Um, to advance whatever objectives they may have, to use it as a, a learning tool. We've had many teachers who have come and joined, and they now bring their students, and they teach them about agriculture, about environmental awareness in a way that perhaps the student wouldn't have had a, had a chance to do. Um, so is our space neutral? Absolutely not, and, and I encourage it. I, when we have our walkthrough with new members, I go around the garden, and we say, this is what this is, and please lock the gate when you leave, and turn the water off. And, and feel free to freelance a little bit, push the boundaries and, and see you know, where, where you can go with this space. I, I, I view it more of a physical space. Um, it's, it's an intellectual space, it's a social space, it's a communal space. Um, and we have our rules and we have our regulations and we have our guidelines and we have our committees, but I, I wanna see the space continue to evolve and really be a garden community as much as it is a community garden. Thank you again, everybody. It is a really such a pleasure to be here and to be able to ask questions as both a sociologist and a former park practitioner. So I'm gonna ask a variety of kinds of questions and I'll start with Sophie, I guess. One thing I was wondering if you could talk about, maybe for the benefit of the audience a bit, is a bit more about the difference between allotment gardens and community gardens. As far as I know, the United States doesn't have much of a history of allotment gardening and this was quite new to me. Um, and one thing that I'm really curious about the difference is whether the politics of these spaces are as different as they are often made out to be, in particular in Europe. So the question, I guess, really is like, does the form of these spaces matter? Places where everyone clearly gets their own allotment versus a community garden that in theory is more communal. Does it play out that way? Or do the politics of these spaces have more to do with the sort of broader politics governance context in which it's taking place? Um, also, I, I guess I wanted to invite you more to say more about what the photographs can do and what we can learn from these documents. I would love to hear more about what motivated this project for you and what you think you've learned from the, the visual evidence. Andrew. So one practical question. I mentioned this in the email correspondence we have. I just learned um, from maybe a reputable source, that apparently the amount of lead dust in the air in Detroit from housing demolition makes gardening really dangerous, not just because of the soil, but even if you're doing raised beds because of the uh, lead particles in airborne dust. And the person who told me this, who you should meet because he's at your university, also said, you know, he was just like, I don't know what to do because people really want to garden. And it's not just the kind of corporate interests who want to represent Detroit as a green place. It's also progressive, young people right. and nonprofits. So what do we do? My second question, then he suggested trees. And he said, we should have Christmas tree farms. But based on my memory of being a park practitioner in New York, trees are often sometimes really frightening for people in cities because mm -hmm. they're things, places where dangerous people hide and bad things can happen. And so I just wondered if you could speak to the sort of practicality of all this. Um, and it's, wow, gardens are becoming governance or like these nonprofits are taking, so is that really true? I mean, in terms of the scale at which public education is happening or the kinds of resources that these, um, I don't know what we call them, nonprofits or community organizations have, that's, a fascinating claim, and I would love to hear more about it. And I will ask one more sort of more abstract question that anybody could answer 
one thing that always preoccupies me is the question of whether or not gardening or urban agriculture or nature is unusual in its capacity for multiple interpretations. Like if it is more possible for these spaces to be used differently by different groups at the same time or for the same practice gardening to mean more different things, to be politically conservative or to be really progressive or to be an escape from politics or a demonstration of politics. Um, I think yes, but I'd like to know what you guys think. And Bill, also really fascinating. Um, I was very curious about the question of how communal your community garden is and if in general you think the communalness wins out or if the individual interests win out and what, when do the communal interests win, if maybe it's the fight against the housing developers, but um, I'm sure we'd all be interested in those politics. And I'm also quite curious about the relationship between housing and gardens that you mentioned and the sort of, you call it a false opposition that's created between the two. Um, and I wondered, I think you're absolutely right, and how dependent is that on being in a place like the Lower East Side when space is at a premium? And what happens in a place like Detroit where there is a lot of space? So I will stop there. You guys can each respond or not respond, but say something. <laughs> And then we'll we'll take some questions. Um, Maybe Sophie, you want to start? Yeah. So um, I guess I will answer your first question first, and then maybe say a few things tacking onto the first response. So I think allotment gardens are definitely communal spaces, um, and I wanted to say about a comment you made earlier that the entire endeavor started by um, Austrian Nature Pass um, stating in their journal, um, it's one of the quotes that I really remember well because it speaks to their endeavor. They say, many of us would like to move to the country, but what the individual cannot achieve, we can achieve as a community. So this garden is really from the beginning uh, based on communal structures. While before World War I, this is based on a loose organization and on a club um, where there's not mandated labor. For example, you will actually have that during World War I already, that everybody has to commit so and so many hours per month to the entire endeavor. You will have a strengthening of these structures. What's really interesting about these um, communal structures is that increasingly over the period that I'm studying, they will also be ingrained with municipal structures and even federal structures. So there are different grants in place that will fund the endeavors, uh, while at the same time there are also negotiations, what are we as a group, um, and how do we govern our organization. Um, we were also saying before, because of all these uh, disputes on the plot, you know, where is the fence and so on. There would be a fencing commission, a water commission, a pathway commission, a legal commission. So you see, so you see these structures evolving as the organization grows. And then of course there are also representatives that will then actually talk to members of the city hall. Um, so um, yeah. and. Within that, of course, I would also say at the same time, we see um, activities emerging that are um, not structured in this way. So also there are um, groups that will go hiking together or that perform plays. There's a wonderful image of uh, two allotment gardeners very early, like performing to be an elephant to enact nat quote unquote natural life, which was really important to them. Um, maybe, I'll, maybe I will come back to the documents in a minute and let somebody else. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Bill, would you like to go next? Sure. So uh, I think determining whether or not communal or individual interests went out would depend on who you ask. Um, the people whose individual interests went out usually would say, yes, of course it's perfectly communal and everybody gets their chance. <laughs> um, it, it really, I mean, there's, there's practical and philosophical ways mm. to look at it, I, I think. We have, I'll just use our plots as an, as an example, we have 45 plots and some years we have extras and some years we have a waiting list. Um, 
and the people who want to grow tomatoes, and they can't because they don't have a plot, and all there's left is concrete. And we say, if you can grab a container and do it, have at it. You know, they'll argue that this isn't communal. It's supposed to be a community garden, that this is supposed to be open to everybody. This is part of the community, and I was part of the team that fought for 25 years to keep it open, and why are you telling me I don't have the space? Um, and then there are philosophical questions about whether or not it's, it's communal. We have a fence with a lock that we lock every single night, and this is based on past practice where if we don't keep it locked, sometimes things walk away or, you know, people use the space in nefarious ways. Um, I think everybody's trying to make it communal, but like I mentioned, everybody brings their own interest to the garden and it probably doesn't help that I'm encouraging people to push the boundaries, but um, I, I would say that it's, it's as communal as it can be in practice. Your question about housing is, I wish I had a, a better answer to it, but I do view it as a, as a false dichotomy. Um, it is an incredibly short supply here, and I think it's a much tougher question in dense urban environments. M my view, since I'm a gardener, tends to be that you can change policies, you can change regulations, you can change legislation to create incentives to create affordable housing, but you can't do that to create open space. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the avenues we should be pursuing. Um, but it's hard to argue with somebody who um, looks at 46 community gardens in one neighborhood and says you can't give up five of them to build an affordable building. We have the funding for it. We have a developer. The city's behind us. You can't move these guys across the street. It's, it, it's a tough question. Um, but, but, but I keep coming back to the idea that open space is, is a sacred thing and uh, you can't just create it with the stroke of a pen. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll take the question about lead dust first. Um, I mean, because it's probably the quickest answer. Um, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that about demolished houses because it's already a huge problem with regards, and I'd be curious to see what, how this works in New York, because um, I'm understanding this problem in many American cities because automob mm -hmm. automobiles ran on leaded gasoline for a long time, and so that left a huge amount of residue in soil. At least that's part of the story in Detroit. I don't know if people talk about that here in test soil. And then there are plans, there's this massive sort of um, surveillance plan in Detroit in which every vacant house was cataloged by teams of people going around the city, which is an amazing task in a city of 139 square miles, because um, it's very sprawling. But that was done to begin a mass demolition process, and actually money from the bankruptcy is being set aside for this mass demolition. And that is a huge environmental justice issue, actually, if you live in a neighborhood, let's say you're one of the people, and this is pretty common in neighborhoods with high vacancy rates where you'll have five or six empty houses, and they're often, for some, for some reason, often together, one or two houses with families in them together, and then empty houses on the other side, um, or at least empty officially. And um, when those houses get demolished, yeah, you have lead paint from decades in them, right? What's gonna happen? Um, I think it, in some ways it just goes back to the issue I mentioned before, which is, there are techniques to remediate lead paint, um, one of the lar or just lead in the soil and other heavy metals. Um, one of the largest urban farms in Detroit, which is actually partially funded by the Franciscan monks, had the resources to bulldoze basically the top four feet of soil and create these kinds of berms and do that kind of thing. And then there's experiments that I know less about involving sunflowers and bioremediation. I don't know if anyone can speak more about that. I think it's actually fascinating as like a symbolic kind of discussion, you know, um, as much as it is an actual scientific one. Um, but in, yeah, I think it's, it raises an environmental justice issue, if, um, for sure. With regards to governance and what I said about that, um, Detroit is a city um, that, and I think a lot of the kind of post-industrial cities in the, in mid the Midwest face this issue, uh, particularly in a pronounced way where you've had so much withdrawal from the public sector that you have foundation money becoming the circuit of capital that in some neighborhoods is more important than private money. I mean, there's kind of almost like adopt a neighborhood programs by different organizations like, or different foundations like Kresge in New York where they'll literally put up signs kind of like you'll see in like the cultural district, like Midtown, like signs in certain neighborhoods. This is the Kresge Foundation's um, neighborhood. Um, where does the money go? Which organizations get it? This is, of course, always a classic question when you have community 
organizations all vying for foundation money. And urban ag, organizations with urban agricultural projects have gained a lot of visibility in the last 10 years. And some of the prominent ones have been really successful at getting a lot of money, primarily on the public health benefits of urban ag, that, those kinds of arguments, food justice, and so on. And what those foundation-driven projects are is they're community health projects, they're food education projects, they're in short, projects that go to that classic idea of governmentality, the kinds of surveillance of the health and the biopolitics of the population, and farms become a part of that process. And it's this interesting question, so that's what I'd say about that. After Sandy, we took a really hard look at what we should be doing with the food that's, uh -huh. that's eaten on site. These gardens, all of them are on site to return of the century buildings once were, and were either felled by arson or demolition, so yeah. they probably weren't any great starting point. Mm -hmm. And Sandy brought in God knows what. So we, we made a policy, and this is just because we don't have the resources to bring in 8,000 tons of clean soil that if you were going to grow food, you had to raid it, build a raised bed, you had to bring in clean soil. Um, and uh, there really was no, no two ways about it. We just want to make sure that we're safe. The, the larger issue, and this is off topic a little bit for agriculture, is just what do we do about the kids that dig and run and play with toys? Because they may not be eating it, but they're being exposed to it. Um, don't have a really good answer for that other than advising our, our parents and people to bring the take your kids home and wash them after they play. Right. Over time, we're hoping that it'll get better and we've laid probably 200, 200 tons of soils after Sandy of clean soil to kind of create a, a new layer, but um, it, it's a constant fear. Okay, so let's take some questions. I'd be curious about the exchange between uh, the current communities active in urban gardening in the US uh, and Europe, specifically with like Austria and, and Germany, and I'm not familiar how in how far this is a phenomenon in Switzerland, but I know, for example, in Berlin, there are many urban gardening groups, and I'd be curious to hear if there is exchange between groups in Detroit or between your group and, like, say, Prinzessin and Garten, and what kind of exchange, if there is that exchange, what, what is that like, and how helpful is it? Um, well, the, yeah, I mean, the short answer is yes. There has been a lot of exchange. In fact, in particular between Germany um, and the Netherlands, and actually Berlin is often talked about. I think there's a lot of people in Detroit who look at the way Berlin has transformed in the last 10 or 20 years and kind of aspire to something. I mean, it would be great if there was some political will and the money to build like a capital in Detroit or something like that, that kind of mass, that mass kind of project. Um, but short of that, there's a lot of parallels drawn between Detroit and Berlin, and there's quite a bit of traffic, um, particularly at the level of exchange between universities, um, between Wayne State, various universities in Germany. Um, I, right now, though, I see it as something that the end results still haven't percolated up yet, and I think they will soon, but, um, but it's almost like barely a week goes by where I don't receive an email from someone, not just from Germany, but it could be the Netherlands, France, who is interested in urban gardens in Detroit. So certainly, the, where I'm, from, where at, from where I'm at, I see a lot of people coming in this direction. So in New York, there, there is a citywide <laughs> coalition um, that, that's fairly strong and getting stronger. And perhaps a, a good example is in the Lower Side in East Village, we have uh, a collective that I wouldn't say represents, but is a collective of all 46 gardens there that really got strengthened in the last six months. We fought hard to try to establish what we call a community gardens district down here. Um, the mayor is continuing to pursue affordable housing goals, which are laudable. Um, and about six months ago, an RFP went out um, for vac what they consider vacant land. And some of these vacant lands were actually community gardens. So we got together and we said, let's, let's brand this. This is the community gardens district. This is part of the fabric of this neighborhood. This is as much a history of this neighborhood as anything else. Um, and we were organized before, but having an issue to organize around obviously makes you stronger. Um, and I think we're seeing more and more uh, discussion and sharing of ideas. Um, and uh, a colleague in, in the audience um, has suggested that we have a summit uh, in the spring, not only among community gardens, but all open space advocates to get on the same page, to, to not make community gardens this weird hybrid or this weird outlier um, of open space that they have been in the past, but to kind of recognize the value of open space no matter how it's, it's branded. What you said made me realize that also, I mean, I can think of another really clear case of this back and forth between Europe and the US is in Paris, where in the northeast side of Paris, where I've done field work, um, there's a mobilization to turn a massive um, unused patch of land and abandoned train station into a major urban park. And 
the leaders of that mobilization were inspired partly by a trip to New York City, and they met members of the Green Gorillas, you know, which played a really important role in the 70s. And so you can see kind of a direct exchange of New York City's urban gardening history, at least in that city. And I'm sure there are many, many others. Yeah, yeah and I wanted to add that historically, um, at least allotment gardeners have been really well organized. Um, starting in the late 1920s, they had for the first time international summits. Um, their main office was in Belgium and still today is. So at the end of the 1920s, almost at least of all countries in Europe, they were meeting every couple of years. Um, and I think what's important to point out is that um, the dissemination of information was always really key to allotment garden endeavors. So we really have to understand these photographs in kind of um, uh, a publicity campaign. Um, also the journals that each of these communities had, as well as statistics they collected of all of their endeavors. Um, one particularly interesting aspect of this uh, promotional campaigns, I think, were produce exhibitions that they launched um, locally and internationally. And allotment gardeners, individual communities, but also citywide, had prices every year that they would give to the cooperative that was the most successful in tending the most the most beautiful apples and the most beautiful pumpkins. And they were actually um, yeah, given prices at these exhibitions. I read that there's a big roof garden movement here in New York, and I'm curious, is there any public policy now to encourage roof gardens? Uh, so this one's, I guess, in reference to the title, At the Grassroots, and I'm wondering, uh, it seems like what, in terms of the future of urban agriculture, whether or not, does urban agriculture not go well within institutions? I know like there's been the Five Borough Farm Report in New York and trying to figure out at a policy level how this would work to you know, rezone for urban agriculture. And in Boston, they've done something similar. But is, is urban agriculture not lend itself well to kind of being a little bit more institutionalized? Is it kind of always like a fringe movement? Is it kind of always at the margins? Or even in you know, um, the open space community, well, is it something at the margins or does it um, lend itself well in terms of the future of urban agriculture of becoming more part of the culture of cities institutionally? My ears perked up when I heard rooftop gardens in the city. Why, well, that's rhetorical, but how can we possibly mobilize to force high-rise buildings to allow us up on the roofs first and second to do something constructive. Um, I've lived in tall buildings for a long time uh, and I, we're never allowed up there, you know, and it's, um, uh, well, what can we do? I mean, is there, like, how, how would we mobilize for that? Who do we talk to? The mayor? <laughs> you guys? Who do you talk to? I think I would start with the community board. Our, there's a, a massive development going up on Delancey Street now, yeah. um, the old Spurra site, and there's going to be a community garden on top of one of those buildings. And I'm sure part of the reason was the community board banging away at these developers as they came in month in and month out to present their plans. I, I think that you have to start at the grassroots um, and let people know what, what you want. The community boards, in my experience, are, are really effective if you, if you have vocal people on the board. So that's where I would start. I don't know if there's a city policy on roof gardens. I know that they're incredibly popular. There's school community, or school roof gardens. So uh, uh, I'm assuming they're allowed by building codes or zoning, but, but that's an assumption on my part. Would anyone like to field the do community gardens resist institutionalization question? So, I mean, obviously, like, my answer is um, no, they can be institutionalized. I mean, they can be very powerful. And from the, yeah, historic example that, that I've studied, I mean, that is the conclusion. But I also think um, presently in Vienna, for example, because these allotment gardens have such a long history and because they're... Um, Politically, so they were historically affiliated with the Social Democratic Party because um, it was a way to, to give to workers uh, a green space. The, these structures are actually after more than 100 years still in place. So today you have more than 100,000 allotment gardeners in the city of Vienna. I think that's a 20th of the population. 
So, of course, if you try to take away anything, th there's a very big organization behind them that will try to rally and band together to um, make these things stick. So I really think, you know, um, it starts with small organizations, but yeah, you organize on higher levels and yeah, can be institutionalized. No, I think that actually, and I can only speak to Detroit, I, probably every political landscape is different and has to be negotiated differently, but in Detroit, urban ag and urban gardening is a place where you can see grassroots changing institutions. Um, institutions of, and of course institutions vary a lot in terms of what they're about and what their mission is. Um, I, mean, I talked about already how community level organizations that might be bigger than block clubs, but not like huge, you know, like charities and so on, or churches um, have taken up urban gardening. And in taking up urban gardening, that's created a link with community. Um, I've seen Wayne State University where I teach has an urban gardening program. And more than almost any other program at the university, I thought that that one has had a really, been an actually a very authentic place where students who might not necessarily be from Detroit hang out with locals in the neighborhood. And you see this really in great intergenerational dynamic that happens. And I think it actually works really well. And um, those <coughs> gardens aren't just places where the institution and the community interact. Those are like two big abstractions, but where like some of the movements that I talked about earlier interact. Like students get exposed to some of these movements I talked about earlier, some of these other kind of food, these ideas about food justice, students learn about that in those places. So, and people in the community learn about stuff going on at the university. So at that level, I actually think they're really great. You know, um, it's been an example of maybe some change from the bottom up and some co-option too. I did want to mention um, one thing that we all touched upon, but that was not as explicitly discussed now, and I think that's relevant to um, also a couple of the questions that were just asked, and that is crisis. I think um, many of these movements actually stem from a particular moment of crisis. And we have, of course, today talked about specifically dense cities and specifically undense cities, but um, both of, like in both cases, um, allotment gardens represent a certain moment of crisis. Um, so I think um, allotment gardens can also be mobilized in these moments of crisis because there will be different entities that are at this particular moment willing to either give land, provide seedlings, or yeah, et cetera, et cetera. I just wanted to add very quickly that in, in New York City there is no zoning designation for community gardens, which makes it difficult because you, you think, well, why don't you just zone it um, a park? But in New York State, once something is declared parkland by the city, it takes an act of the New York State legislature to alienate it for anything other than open space, and the city is not going to give up the acres and acres and acres and acres across the city that are community gardens. Um, as parkland if they know that it's going to take Albany to get it back. Uh, um, the rhetoric of crisis in Detroit, it was very useful for gardening advocates to actually get a uh, urban ag ordinance pushed through mm -hmm. the city level, you know, which was really important. Um, and it's interesting also that at a, that's not like a policy level you can see its impact, but at a symbolic level, um, so much of the art and representations of urban ag in Detroit that you can see on t-shirts or whatever are reworkings of those World War II era gar cartoons about, you know, use spades, not, what is it, spades versus, I can't remember, they're like all these war era slogans and there's this kind of like language of war mobilization that surrounds urban ag in Detroit that I think is really interesting, it speaks a lot to what you're yeah, I want to ask you in your experience, how have you seen that our projects uh, within community gardens have engaged community and engaging building community and um, building community, yeah, our projects related? I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more about the, about the specific crises that gave rise to, to, to the garden movements in other German-speaking countries. Um, and also, I'm, I'm just kind of curious that uh, the name Schrebe hasn't dropped yet in this, because we're in Deutsches Haus and... Uh, and I used to live in Germany for, and Austria for about seven years, and, and for me, they were always called Schrebegarten. Uh, and like every you know, train trip I took, or uh, you know, there, uh, on the outskirts of every city, there were these, 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 these fenced, uh, just these, these, these uh, wild, you know, um, not wild, very neat, uh, uh, just colonies, colonies of gardens, acres and acres and acres. And uh, I used to bike through them a lot, and uh, 
And uh, who was the Schreber? And uh, uh, was it sort of, was it, uh, you touched on this uh, this kind this kind of reform movement and kind of reform health diet and stuff like uh, does it go back to the twenties or is it more kind of an, like an eighteen nineties thing? Um, uh, yeah, I'm I'm just curious more about how this uh, how this movement came and, and was it oh, did it sort of come in waves uh, uh, attached to specific crises, um, economic crises, wars, I suppose. Um, yeah, I'm just curious more about uh, how if it sort of came in fits and starts. And also, uh, was it uh, kind of a grassroots type of thing, more imposed from above, kind of in, in, in the context of this Um I guess that's enough to chew on for a while. <laughs> I will start with the question about the Schreber Garten. Um, so, um, yeah, in my dissertation, I've generally translated Schreber Garten as allotment garden. Mm -hmm. They were called Schreber Garten because of a doctor from Germany um, called Moritz Schreber, who lived in the 19th century. Um, the reason why I think he is actually quite important is because as he and why the Schrebergarten were called Schrebergarten was actually only in honor of him because he had championed health on the outside for children. But um, he was also the inventor of uh, educational devices to help uh, children's health which were also really problematic and quite coercive. And Schreber's uh, medical devices and his pedagogy is actually known as black, pe black pedagogy, it's a German term, because, um, so schwarze pedagogik, because it coerced children um, with certain deficiencies to behave basically in normative physical behaviors. Um, so, this is just one way in going around this and actually saying, so yes, Schreber means something for the allotment gar garden movement in the sense that health always played a role in it. Um, and that actually exercise was at the beginning of the allotment garden movement. It was only later in the context of reform that, that dietary restrictions which emerge somewhat similar, like similarly at the same time in the context of reform also play a major role. And throughout the allotment garden movement you say, see that a lot of reform considerations in the beginning of the 20th century actually converge. So um, education, but also dietary, like vegetarianism and, and so on. Uh, just briefly on, on arts and, and gardens, the creation of a garden to me is as much art as it is science. Um, I, I know we, we put a lot of time at La Plaza into creating the physical space. Um, and just a quick plug, uh, every September all the gardens in the Lower East Side get together and do a harvest festival of the arts where every uh, garden does two full days of programming um, in the arts um, to kind of get people out to celebrate that aspect of the community and also get to see the gardens. What's happening with the LaGuardia community garden here right in the NYU neighborhood with the 2030 plan, is is that a thing of the past? I don't know if any of you can speak to that. Uh, a second question has to do with big spaces like uh, Central Park and other places. I, you seem to speak a little bit about that, but I'm not sure I understood it completely. Uh, what some of the law, the rules are with big spaces like um, Central Park. I mean, one fantasy I have is to have places like that just filled with apple trees and pumpkin patches. Uh, why don't we have a Central Park like that? I, you know, I, I lived in East Village for you know a long time in the 80s and 90s, and uh, on 12th Street there were a few gardens that flipped. One was a former bus depot. Uh, you may know, may be familiar with it and how they, you know, how they dealt with the issue of lead and everything else, but. Uh, is are, are battles still going on, you know, for spaces in East Village, or is that kind of come to a close? Have you guys established a space and others, and that's that? And then my other question came up when you were talking about water shortage, shortages, and if there's anything going on in California right now, given that the drought and how that affects community gardens out there, and how that may later affect Detroit and other cities. Are all the community gardens just city land that they lease, or any of them private? Is it possible for a fundraiser to target a specific plot for purchase to remain a community garden so that no building can occur, or is this just a fantasy? One issue I did want to bring up in the end is also the question of sustainability. I think we tiptoed around this, and I think 
we need to understand that in these movements, there we talk about utopias. We talk about apples. We talk about pumpkins. I wanted to mention the allotment gardeners have this idea in the 1915 that all architecture could be fenced in with sunflower fences and you sit over your journal and you think, oh, it could be such a beautiful world. Um, so there is that. There is this notion of Eden um, with all its problematics. Um, there are also um, concerns, early concerns on sustainability, I think, that arise from the industrializing metropolis. But I think we must also not forget that or at least in my case, these are always not only romanticized fantasies, they also really get at um, urban issues and urban problems. So I think when I see like the allotment gardeners built their communal house out of the rubbles of a quarry, because that's the only thing they can find, yes, sure, that has to do with sustainability. It kind of also links up with some re reform ideas they have, but also it's really the poverty. So I think like sometimes like we have to remind ourselves of that. Sure. I mean, the only closing remarks I'll make is I probably talked more about politics of gardening than gardening itself. And that's, I think, where the real interesting aspects are as a really important part of, just to pick up on what you were saying. Um, like in Detroit, um, you know, people, communities are really hurting for institutions that bring people together to build capacity, and gardens are a really, really important site of that. Um, I do think, though, to raise the issue of sustainability, um, to go back to the question about water, um, you know, I can't talk much about California in detail and what's happening in those cities because I don't have firsthand knowledge of it, but in Detroit, it's interesting because, I mean, you're next to the Great Lakes, which is a actually a significant sh percentage of the world's fresh water, and yet you have a man-made water crisis in a city where there's not enough water, right? And gardening plays a, a role in that, although not most gardens don't use public water on their, you know, people catch rainwater and so on. But if it's at a certain scale, then it has to come from somewhere. Um, so yeah, that, that is a major issue with them, going back, to, like I said, to the inputs and outputs. Most of the community gardens on Lower East Side are on city-owned land, but there are some that are owned by various nonprofit land trusts. Um, I, I can't imagine that the city's interested in selling land off, but I'm sure we'd love to discuss it with you. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what the legal status of LaGuardia is right now. I know that they had an unfavorable ruling not too long ago, but I, I think it might be on appeal. Um, and there are some, some massive community gardens in Brooklyn, and I, I think in the Bronx that are essentially functioning as farms. Um, so uh, uh, if you're interested, I, I'm sure if you Google it, it'll come up. Okay, so thank you all so much for being here, and thank you, Deutsches House, for the hospitality. Thank you.